Welcome to another edition of Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. This week, we delve into the discussion of Nigeria's democracy and its impact on the country's foreign policy over the last 20 years, 21 if you're including this year. Our guest is a man who spent 35 years in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and who retired as Permanent Secretary. Ambassador Joe Keshi avails us the wealth of his experience in our upcoming interview. We'll also hear from Nigerians in the diaspora how they feel about the country's democracy. Now, as usual, let's check in on other discussions in diplomatic circles. Sister to North Korean leader Kim Yo Jong has warned of retaliatory measures against South Korea that could involve the military and the latest escalation of tensions over defectors from the North who have been sending back propaganda and food. Kim Yo Jong, who serves unofficially as one of Kim Jong Un's top aides, issued the warning in a statement carried by state news agency KCNA on Saturday, saying that the rights to taking the next action against the enemy will be entrusted to the general staff of the state's army. Pope Francis has appealed for both sides of the Libyan civil war to make peace, calling on the international community to start talks and protect refugees and migrants, he said, were victims of cruelty in the country. In an impassioned plea during his noon address in St. Peter's Square on Sunday, Pope Francis said he was pained by the situation in Libya, which has had no stable central authority since dictator Muammar Gaddafi was overthrown by NATO-backed rebels in 2011. Meanwhile, Turkey on Sunday announced the last-minute postponement of a visit by the Russian Foreign and Defense Ministers for discussions that had been expected to focus on ending the fighting in Libya. Ankara and Moscow support opposing sides in the conflict, which has displaced tens of thousands of people since April last year. The Turks support the government based in Libya's capital, Tripoli, while Russia backs the other side, supporting renegade General Khalifa Haftar, who in recent weeks has suffered a series of major defeats. Friday, June 12, 2020, was the second time Nigeria would mark Democracy Day after it was changed from May 29th by the Buhari administration. And since Nigeria has been impacted by the coronavirus, there were no celebrations marking the day. But the president gave an early morning address. Democracy Day this year was devoid of the usual celebration accompanying a day when Nigeria remembers the handover of power from military to civilian rule. And maintaining civilian rule for 21 years has been a plus for a nation that has struggled with development of democratic institutions, peaceful elections and maintaining the image of giant of Africa or Africa's big brother. President Muhammad Buhari in his address to the nation early Friday morning said the day which had been changed from May 29th to June the 12th provides the opportunity to reflect on the journey as a nation, its achievements and struggles, and a day for honoring founding fathers who toiled to establish the republic and every Nigerian who has worked tirelessly to sustain it. This year's Democracy Day coincides with the global pandemic which has also affected Nigeria. This day provides us an opportunity to reflect on our journey as a nation, our achievements and struggles. It is a day to honor our founding fathers who toiled to establish our republic and every Nigerian who has worked tirelessly to sustain it. Sustaining our democracy thus far has been a collective struggle and I congratulate all Nigerians and particularly leaders of our democratic institutions for their resilience and determination to ensure that Nigeria remains a shining example of democracy. Nigeria would always be governed by the rule of law and I will do my uttermost to uphold the constitution and protect the lives and property of all Nigerians. Government has initiated a number of policies and programs designed to promote the legal rights of Nigerians, facilitate the institutionalization of a responsive legal system, provide support to all constituted bodies in implementing 
their mandates and improve our custodial system of justice. He then went on to give an account of his stewardship, which he promised on Democracy Day of 2019. He noted achievements in implementing nine priority objectives, the economy, which involved GDP growth since exiting recession, building of external reserves, delivery of significant quantities of affordable and high-quality fertilizers to farmers, the revamping of the nation's cotton, textile and garment sector, and integration of rural communities to the formal economy, amongst others. He even pointed to the ease of doing business ranking which improved from being 146 in the world to 131st, making the country one of the top 10 reforming countries in the world, a development he attributed to the visa on arrival policy. While the government parts itself on the achievements, Nigerians have their thoughts on how far the nation has come. What you have today is, is a, a deformed democracy. A democracy in which the wish of the electorate is not paramount, uh, in which the supremacy of the vote is honored only in the bridge. I'm afraid that there are tendencies that are threatening, that, that are de democratizing, you know, de democratizing Nigeria's political architecture. The question is, what should we be doing to re-democratize? Beyond the shores of Nigeria, Nigerians speak of their impressions of the country and its democracy. A lot of the government system needs to be, to be digitized. We need to see certain paper filling and forms that need to come online, certain processes that um, on, online technology will just lead to like a cut on that. Honestly, I wish I could say, oh, COVID is going to wake us up and change things. Maybe the, the best we can hope for is... Uh, are people that are alert and uh, aware of the faults in our system. What the people need is the reality of democracy, not the celebration of uh, a day uh, named Democracy Day. They want every day to be Democracy Day. The government should basically make it easy for us to come back. I can come back anytime, but can I get a job? That is the problem. The people in powerful positions at universities, in my own case, since that's my field in education, are uh, perhaps threatened. I'm not there to threaten anybody. It's just to give back to my younger people. Democracy works when we allow the different participants to voice out what they think, to bring their opinion without being harassed, and to make sure that they have equal treatment under the law. So again, as uh, the Nigerians in the diaspora mark democracy, they, these are the things they think about, and that's what brings mixed feelings. We have focused on a number of the issues that I think touch on Democracy Day, which uh, people in the private sector, both the U.S. private sector and African private sector, and we have members from both sides, large and small, uh, talk about which are things like good governance, um, uh, fighting corruption, um, democracy and the rule of law. Uh, these are all things that are not only good for uh, citizens, um, whether you're in Nigeria or in the United States, uh, good governance matters, um, but it's also true that it has a major impact on um, the ability of uh, companies um, and people to engage in commercial activity. Hope is still rising that Nigeria will get to the promised land of full democratic governance and that come the next Democracy Day, everyone will be celebrating without second thoughts or hindrance. Ambassador Joe Keshi joins me now to discuss what na impact Nigeria's democracy has had on her foreign policy. Ambassador Joe Keshi, it was a pleasure having you on Diplomatic Channel. First off, we are one of the fewest countries in the world that I know of marking a democracy day. Many countries just have national day or flag day or they mark days of revolutions and change of power. And uh, we're the only ones, I think, that have a day called democracy day. Does that put us in a unique position, though, showing the importance of democracy and how we have lived up to that expectation, seeing that we do have a day like this to celebrate? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me as usual, Amarachi. And um, 
In answer to your question, you use the word unique. It, to be candid, a number of uh, countries or people find Nigeria as a unique country because the, the way we do things, the way we act, the way we do a lot of things, leave people wondering whether why we do some of the things we do, for example. So if we are the only one with um, a democracy day, uh, it's not because we are great Democrats, if you know what I mean. It's because that, um, it, it, I think it's more, it, it's more, it has more to do with the politics of, of the whole thing. Um, in 1999, the, gov the, the, the government that considered the military, I guess they want to associate itself with June 12. So you have one part of the country celebrating the first anniversary of, I mean, celebrating the anniversary of the handover of power yeah. to civilians and another, you know, celebrating uh, actually what could be described as Democracy Day. I, I think what we need to do is to reconcile both and uh, probably find a, a better name for it, like uh, an Abiola day, which gives us the opportunity to talk about that day itself, to remember the heroes of democracy. Because when you look at what we are doing, yes, uh, we, we, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've managed to survive the last 20 years or so of democratic governance in Nigeria. But democracy is not all about just election and power. It, it, it has some values that are still missing in this country, you know, the values of free association, the values of, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the values of justice, equality, and the rest of them, you know, good governance. Yeah, we are still very much away from achieving this. And a good example is some of the things playing out in Edo, for example, and in Lagos, where the ruling really party, um, a group in the ruling party has virtually banned any other association in the state but just one central association. That is anti-democratic. It is not a democracy. And when you look at what is playing out again, where in the world have you seen parties deciding that uh, a, 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 a college has to decide who runs and who does not run? So you can see that uh, we, we've done reasonably well, but we still have a long, long way to go to actually be a serious democratic country. Yeah, and a lot of times, though, Nigerians have been confused as per what the nation's foreign policy is. But is there a relation between democracy and foreign policy? Of, of course, there, there, there is, because at the end of the day, look, Democracy allows people to participate in government, in making decisions, you know, uh, for the country, not just the politicians or those elected. It's like, you know, uh, bottom up, the, the agitation of the people, the wish of the people, the desire of the people, and all these aggregates into the policies, you know, that uh, the, the government at the end of the day, you know, decides to, you know, to, to, to pursue. But if you do not open up the democratic space, if you do not encourage free association, if you do not encourage uh, protest, if you do not encourage or create an atmosphere that allow people to participate in the decision-making process. For example, there is this debate about a bill on, um, on health going on at the National Assembly. You can see that the National Assembly itself is not open seriously open to listening to uh, the vast majority of people who are against that bill. In a democratic uh, setting, the National Assembly shouldn't just take it because we brought it, it must be our bill. No. Yeah. You, you invite the people and at the end of the day, you find a compromise between what the people want and what you think should be done. That itself is how the democratic process you know, works. But when you decide that no, it's what I want that must be done, it, it, it creates real confusion among the people themselves, whether they are really part of the political process or part of the democratic process. Uh, Ambassador, Nigeria's foreign policy did receive a boost when the country returned to civilian rule in 1999. I'm sure you remember that pretty clearly. Uh, before then, she'd been isolated by the rest of the world over the military administration's execution of Ken Sarawua and about eight others. There was a lot of hope for Nigeria when the Obasanjo administration 
uh, uh, took over over the months, uh, it seemed that we were being courted afresh. But today, we have expanded our relations beyond, beyond the West to the East. We're going further to include uh, uh, relations with Middle Eastern countries like the UAE, and we're looking to China, we're looking to Japan, we're looking to other countries outside of the US and outside of the EU and the United States. How has this type of civilian administration affected our, uh, our, our relations uh, with some of these countries? Well, your observation about what happened uh, beginning from 1999 is true. Uh, the first tax that uh, the then government of uh, President Obasanjo did was, of course, to ensure that uh, they, they created the atmosphere that allowed the paria status of Nigeria to be removed. And once that was removed, we were back, uh, you know, we were acceptable to the international community. So bear in mind that this is, this, is, this is a big country. We are just being Nigeria with our large population, with our market and our dynamism and, you know, the expectation is still that uh, we are the hope of the of the region, the hope of the continent. The question is whether we are living to, to it. But as a country itself, as a country with such a, you know attitude, continue to be an international player uh, with the uh, job nations. It now depends on what we do at home to strengthen that position to to end the respect of the people who deal with us. But yes. As long as we continue to improve on our democracy, as long as we continue to ensure that we create that political space that allow, you know, inclusive participation, as long as we build up our economy, as long as we allow uh, justice, free, you know, justice, equity, and fairness to reign in this country, I, I think that uh, we can actually get up to that place that the president a few days ago described as a shining star. We, we are not yet there yet, but we can and we, we should aspire to be. Yeah, and I know one of the major um, challenges for this administration, that's the Buhari administration, has been, you know, Nigeria's relations with South Africa. And we're talking about the immigration uh, 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 crisis and the xenophobic attacks that have been going on. Do we understand what our foreign policy was at that time? and how the government backed that up in that situation? No, 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 no. Our, our foreign policy did not precipitate any, any crisis that extended to, to South Africa. It was purely domestic situation in South Africa that led to the attack. And certainly, of course, when, when such attack happens on you, I mean, when your people are attacked, you know, in a foreign land, it of course creates some frictions between the two governments, and that's the area of foreign policy, you know, that that is involved. But certainly, uh, nothing we did or nothing, you know, in our relationship with the South African government led to that crisis. It was purely an internal affairs in South Africa, you know, internal domestic situation in South Africa, the poverty, the anger, the inability of the government of South Africa to look after its people or to you know, to fulfill the expectations of the people, which was many people were expecting great things to happen after uh, apartheid collapsed. But the blacks found themselves that they are not doing as well as they had expected. And I, I guess, and then they now see foreigners prospering in their own country, naturally, in a, almost in every part of the world, that in itself provoked some, of, some uh, unexpected crisis. Some researchers, Ambassador, have talked about the politics of foreign policy making, pointing out the lack of participation in foreign policy formulation and participation of the government in this. And, and they think that this may be why it is difficult to decipher the country's foreign policy. So whose responsibility is it to come up with foreign policy for Nigeria? Uh, is it the, the, for the government or even for the present administration? You know, in a democratic setting, in a country where the political space is open, in a country where people have the high sense and commitment in terms of participation, the, the formulation of any policy, not just, the, not just uh, foreign policy, is the responsibility of everybody. You can see that um, 
you, you, you can see that. Let, let me give you two examples. Um, I'm sure if you go down history, you, you will see that at independence, we signed a defense pact with uh, the British government. But it, it, but it took student and, uh, you know, uh, and labor opposition to that pact. And the Balewa government had to, you know, renege or cancel that part completely. That is the impact when people are consciously aware of their own role and the need for them to participate, you know, uh, in the process. There are, I mean, there are machineries for aggregating this, which is where you begin to see uh, other agencies of government, you know, contributing to the formulation of foreign policy. But the people also can contribute to the formulation of foreign policy. And indeed, all policies, if they become conscious of their own responsibilities. Today, you can see what's going on in the, in, uh, in the United States and around the world, where people are demonstrating for change, particularly against police brutality. The demonstration is certainly going to cause some changes in some policies. And that's what's lacking in this country over time, I guess, because uh, uh, you know, quite a number of things has happened in our own environment, and people are very, I think, they focus on something as their survival rather than get out of the street to demonstrate for good governance and the rest of it. Yeah, but do you think what's happening in the U.S., because I know that apart from listening to people's opinion, public opinion on issues, um, which is pretty common in the United States, take, for example, the war in Vietnam, America eventually had to pull out because uh, public opinion was not favorable on the government concerning the war. Um, do you think that is something that can be replicated in Nigeria? Do you think the government cares enough about what the population thinks about some of its uh, policies and its reactions you know, towards um, certain, certain decisions made by the government? No, it has nothing to do with whether the government cares enough. It has something to do whether the people believe in their own rights to cause changes in government policy. But like I said, you know, we've all become very complacent. We've all, I, I guess, look, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. I think for most Nigerians, for most Nigerians, the issue of survival is the most important thing to them now. In a way, there's a disconnect between government in this country and the people. And so for the most of the people, it's, look, let me try and survive. Government can do whatever they like and so on. But maybe somewhere along the line, you know, if our situation improves, if we can reduce poverty and people are, um, are the welfare of the people, the, the condition of the people improves, and then the people become very conscious, and then they can begin to pay attention to the politics of everything, I guess that they'll be inspired to, you know, uh, to, to, to join the fray and begin to advocate for changes in policy. Look, take, for example, the, the raging issue of rape in this country. There, there's a constituency that is fighting that, look, this must stop. And government is listening. That is the power of people to take part in the decision-making process. But where we all become complacent and decide that we are not going to be involved. Look, we're actually encouraging the government to become a dictatorship. Because it is when people protest against, for example, injustice, when people protest against nepotism, when people protest against unfairness in the system, that is when government is compelled to change. But if you do not protest and if you do not make any impact or to, to take this up with government, Government and government people just begin to do, they believe they know what you want. And because you are not protesting, they think that they are doing the right thing. And that is why when you look at all the newspapers in the last two days, you, you, just, you just be shocked at what you are hearing in terms of development. And that's because people are not really challenging the government to do more for the people. Ambassador Keshe, you've given us a lot to think about this week. Thanks again for joining us on Diplomatic Channel. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That's the show today. Thanks again for watching. You can always catch up with previous episodes on youtube.com slash channels web. Just go to the playlist and search for Diplomatic Channel. You can reach me via any of the social media addresses on your screen. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time.